सवितुर वरम रूपम ज्योति परस्य धीमहे यन्ना सत्येन दीपये ओ शांति 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 हे नमस्कार माय डियर ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर्स Srimad Bhagavad Gita, popularly called just the Gita, is a scripture with a universal appeal. It's one of the most widely translated books in the world. And why it has this universal appeal is not difficult to understand. It is a rather small scripture, just 700 verses, two lines each. Then. It has been written in the context of a story. Stories are not only interesting, they are also much easier to learn something from than from abstract philosophy. And uh, further, here in the story, there is a problem and uh, that problem is resolved. And uh, therefore, the reader feels that since I also have a problem, if I turn to this scripture, probably my problem will also get solved or at least resolved. And uh, the fact is that uh, if nothing else, at least a person turning to the scripture in difficult times gets a lot of solace and uh, one can confidently say that the number of psychotic breakdowns prevented by the Gita far exceeds those that have been prevented by any psychiatrist so far. Sri has added yet one more reason why the Gita has a universal appeal. In any scripture, there are two parts, a perennial part and a temporal part. The perennial part is that which is uh, valid for all time at all places, whereas the temporal part is uh, relevant to the period in history when the scripture was composed and uh, the place where it was composed and uh, with the passage of time and change of place, some of those things may become quite irrelevant or even invalid. In the Gita, Sri Aurobindo has pointed out, the perennial component far exceeds the temporal component. Before we go to what the Gita really says, let me recreate the scene briefly. Now here is uh, the battlefield and uh, Arjun, one of the most accomplished men of the age, is uh, leading an army, the army of the Pandavas and uh, it is facing the army of the Kauravas on the other side and uh, the war has become necessary because uh, as a Kshatriya, as a warrior, it is Arjun's duty to protect good from evil and uh, to protect justice from injustice and uh, therefore in this particular situation where the Kauravas have uh, through their evil designs uh, taken undue advantage of the Pandavas and deprived them of their kingdom, it, becomes, it has become necessary as a last option to go in for a war. However, before fighting, Arjun tells his uh, charioteer, Lord Krishna, to place the chariot in the middle of the battlefield so that he can see who all are there from the Kaurava side who are there in the battle and uh, then he finds that uh, amongst those who have come to fight this war are his cousins, his teachers and uh, his grandfather and so on and so forth and uh, then he suddenly feels that uh, how can I kill all of them and therefore he tells Krishna that uh, I do not want the kingdom, I will not fight. So here is a dilemma that Arjun has and uh, he tells Lord Krishna clearly, I will not fight. But then uh, Lord Krishna tries to remind him of his duty, his duty as one who is uh, there to protect good from evil, to protect justice from injustice 
and uh, it's only some lucky Kshatriyas who get such an opportunity during their lifetime to be able to fulfill the purpose for which they are here in this world. And uh, if uh, that is the only reminder that uh, the teacher had to give Arjun, then the Gita could have been very short. He could have just told him, no, I am telling you to fight. And so you fight and the Gita would have been over. And therefore, as a good teacher, Lord Krishna goes in for what we these days call lateral learning. That is uh, not just solving the problem, but resolving the problem and in that process giving the student a lot more than is strictly necessary for solving the problem. And uh, what is it that he tells him? What Lord Krishna tells him is that uh, the purpose of life is union with the divine and this can be achieved through three approaches, action, knowledge and devotion. And actually, if we look at these three, what are they? They are uh, the three basic tools that we have for action in the world. Hands to act, the heart to feel, and uh, the head to think. So, use the hands to serve the divine, use the heart to adore the divine, and use the head to know the divine. So, that is how we get these three approaches. And uh, that is where the difficulty with many commentaries on the Gita begins. Since the Gita is uh, a widely read book, naturally there is also no dearth of commentaries on the Gita. But uh, most of these commentaries tend to be one-sided. Some of the commentaries would say that the main thing that the Gita teaches is action and uh, that our duty should be performed in a disinterested manner. Yet others would say that no, the Gita clearly says that knowledge is superior to action. And yet somebody else would say that no, the Gita clearly says that meditation is superior to knowledge. And yet another commentator might say that the main thing the Gita teaches is renunciation. Renounce the fruit of the action and renounce all desire. And therefore the main thing that the Gita teaches is renunciation. And yet somebody else would say that no, the main thing that the Gita teaches is devotion because uh, the Lord has assured him, take refuge in me and I will relieve you of all sin and evil and therefore you will have then no necessity to grieve and suffer and uh, therefore the main thing the Gita teaches is devotion. And the fact is that the Gita does say all these things and therefore the commentator can quote chapter and verse and say here you are, this is what the Gita says. But then, when the Gita says so many diverse things, some of them conflicting with each other, one has to think, what is it that the Gita really is trying to say? And that is what Sri Aurobindo has done in his essays on the Gita. Essays on the Gita expands the Gita, which has just 18 chapters, into 48 essays, 48 very lucidly written essays, which go on for about 500 pages. And in these essays, what Sri Aurobindo has done is, although he has followed roughly the same sequence as the Gita, he has taken the liberty of going back and forth to bring out what is that unified message that the Gita actually gives us, in spite of all these diverse statements that it makes at different points. What is it that the Gita as a whole is trying to tell us? And for that, what Sri Aurobindo has done in the essays on the Gita is to look at the entire Gita in one sweep. And that is what we shall try to see now. If we look at the Gita, we find that uh, its 18 chapters can be divided roughly into three parts of six chapters each. The first one third of the Gita, that is the first six chapters, focus on action or work. The middle one third is primarily about knowledge and the last one third of the Gita about devotion. Now let's see why that particular sequence. Lord Krishna is a very good teacher and a good teacher starts with what the student already knows something about, what the student is familiar with and from there proceeds to the unfamiliar. Now Arjun is basically a man of action and is well versed in the dharma, in the type of life that a Kshatriya should be leading and uh, therefore all he needs is a little reminder about what his duty is in this particular situation 
and this duty is not for uh, himself, it is to protect the society as a whole from uh, evil and injustice. So he gives him this reminder, but then what has happened here is that a person who is uh, very well versed in all this and is one of the leading men of the race is in a state of a moral crisis. He has suddenly been overtaken by attachment, attachment to his near and dear ones and therefore he does not want to fight. Now these attachments and uh, this aversion to kill is uh, not really rooted in the deepest truths of existence and therefore to be able to overcome this dilemma which Arjun has, properly speaking if we go to the roots of it, he needs knowledge, knowledge about the deeper truths of existence which also he may have but uh, at this moment he has forgotten it and he is finding it difficult to bring that knowledge into his life, he is finding it difficult to actually apply it in the situation in which he is and therefore he needs at length this knowledge. So while uh, keeping the student's temperament and his previous background in mind, in the first one third of the Gita, Krishna starts with action, reminds him of his duty and tells him that uh, he should do it and if he doesn't, if he misses this opportunity of fulfilling the purpose of his life, not only he will uh, be doing something sinful, but uh, he will also uh, be laughed at, he will be ridiculed and uh, so on and so forth. But then uh, for really understanding why he should still fight in spite of the people facing him being his teachers and uh, near and dear ones, he needs deeper knowledge and uh, to create curiosity in the student for that knowledge is the first thing that the teacher should do because uh, it's only when the student himself wants to know that he'll be truly receptive to the knowledge. And therefore we find that in the first one third of the Gita itself, certain statements are made which would make the student curious for the type of knowledge that uh, will help him understand these things at a deeper level, look at the situation from a higher plane. For example, in the second chapter itself, he is told, karmane vadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana, uh, you have uh, the right or the entitlement to action but not to the fruit of the action. Now ordinarily a person would feel that if I am doing something, why I do not have the entitlement also to the fruit of the action? And then later he is told that uh, only an ahankar vimud atma, that is one who has been bewildered by his arrogance feels that he is the doer of the action, actually he is not the doer. So first he is told to renounce the fruit of the action, then he is told to renounce also the doership. And then he is told that uh, death is not something so serious because it is like changing the dress and uh, therefore wise people do not really grieve for those who die. Now all these things are very difficult to understand at the ordinary mental level and therefore the curiosity for knowing those deeper truths of existence which will make all this understandable has been aroused. Now once the curiosity of the student has been aroused in the first one third of the Gita, then we find in the middle one third comes actually that knowledge which will help him understand all this and uh, the climax is reached in chapters 10 and 11. In the 10th chapter, Lord Krishna tells him, quite a bit about himself and uh, makes him realize that uh, this person who is in front of him, whom he has been treating as a friend, is actually God incarnate and everything happens because of his will, nothing happens which, is, which he does not will and uh, so in the 10th chapter, Lord Krishna tells him that uh, all that happens in this world is the result of the divine will and that he himself is that divine in a human form who is in front of him. Well, Arjun tells him that yes, I believe all that, but uh, I want to see. Now that is the difference between knowledge and experience. Experiential knowledge is much more real to a person than theoretical knowledge. So in the 10th chapter, he has been given only theoretical knowledge and uh, now he wants the experience. 
and uh, Lord Krishna tells him that you are dear to me and therefore I will give you divine eyes, Divya Chakshu. Because it is only with those eyes that you can see what I truly am. And then he reveals himself to him in both his uh, ferocious form, the form that kills and also in the benign form that loves which is all love and delight. So he reveals both these forms to him in the 11th chapter and uh, now that uh, Arjun has uh, really experienced the divine, he knows the divine better than one can through just theoretical knowledge, he realizes his mistake, he realizes that this person whom I have been treating as my friend is actually God incarnate and if he is in front of me, why need I think? The one who knows everything is there, so I'm, let me just do what he tells me to do. Now that is the attitude of a devotee. So Arjun's devotion is a corollary to the knowledge. Once he has realized the glory of the Lord, then this devotion has become just a byproduct of that knowledge. It's a corollary to the knowledge and therefore now he is ready to learn a little bit more about devotion and that is what comes in the last one third of the Gita. So we can understand why the Gita follows this particular sequence and uh, therefore when Arjun finally acts, he acts but is not uh, insisting on a particular fruit. He will act without any hatred for the Kauravas and uh, he will do it as an instrument of the divine, realizing that in fact the death of the Kauravas is a foregone conclusion and that it is his privilege to have been chosen as the instrument for this action. So his action is actually what we might call inspired by devotion, full of devotion. And uh, this devotion is possible because he has the knowledge. So in fact that three approaches have united to finally make Arjun do what he will do, that is he will fight. We have seen why the Gita follows that particular sequence, action, knowledge and devotion. But then the main thing about the Gita is not that this should be the sequence, the main thing is the flexibility. That is the flexibility of approach, the student can start whichever way the student is best suited to start in keeping with his uh, inclinations, temperament, capacity and so on and circumstances. So in keeping with all this, the student can start with any of these three approaches, action, knowledge or devotion and this flexibility comes out in the 12th chapter of the Gita where in the beginning Lord Krishna tells Arjuna that this is what you should do and if you can't do this, then this is what you can do. If you can't do even this, then this is what you can do. So the approach is highly student centered, which means that uh, the sequence need not be exactly as it is in the Gita. So let us see what the alternative sequences can be. Suppose somebody is, uh, instead of being action oriented, somebody is knowledge oriented. This person can uh, learn about the divine from books like the Upanishads and uh, this might create in him the aspiration to actually experience the divine the way Arjun was inspired and uh, with the, a proper approach he will actually get the experience. So he may be inspired to know the divine, to have the experience of the divine the way Arjun was and uh, with the proper approach and with divine grace he may actually have the experience and when he has the experience then uh, like Arjun he will become a devotee and then he would say what is the use of all this knowledge and devotion if uh, I do nothing for the object of my devotion. So action would come in. Let us start with yet another type of a seeker who is more inclined to devotion and uh, that is what a very large number of our spiritual masters have been. They have not been men of letters, they have not been highly educated in the normal sense of the word. Sri Ramakrishna, Guru Nanak, Mirabai, Tulsi Das and so on. Uh, they were not highly lettered people and yet we find that uh, because of pure intense and sincere devotion, they could actually experience the divine directly. So devotion itself can lead to the experience of the divine and uh, once they have the experience, some of them have actually tried to give a description of what they experienced and the description that uh, they have given becomes a scripture. So, People with intense devotion, 
need not really read a scripture to experience the divine, they can create a scripture. And then this uh, devotee would say, what is the use of all this devotion and knowledge if I do not do anything for the object of my devotion? And uh, therefore action will come in. So what Sri Aurobindo actually brings out in the essays in the Gita is that uh, the student has the freedom to start whichever way the student is uh, most comfortable. He can start with action or knowledge or devotion. But if he stays on any of these three paths sincerely and for long enough, eventually he will be following all the three paths. And therefore, the three paths of the Gita are not really three. The triune, in fact, is one. So this is what Sri Aurobindo has done in the essays on the Gita. Instead of uh, trying to favor one or the other approach, he has shown that in fact the three approaches are only for convenience. They are for the convenience of the seeker. He can start with whichever approach he likes, but in fact the three are one. And uh, therefore the triple path of the Gita, as he calls it, is actually one of the most uh, student-centered paths for approaching the divine and uh, the three paths actually fuse into one after the seeker has been on the path long enough and sincerely enough. So it is in this light that we can uh, understand and resolve the various conflicts that we find between different commentaries on the Gita and those conflicts are primarily because of the bias that the commentator has and that personal bias and that personal bias gets reflected in the commentary. But uh, Sri Aurobindo's commentary, essays on the Gita, looks at the Gita as a whole and uh, brings out what the Gita is really trying to say. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnam Evavashishyate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti